it's to have eminent scientists and speakers like you sir in this webinar at the beginning i would like to thank you for readily agreeing to our proposal to present a seminar on online mode this department plant breeding and genetics is now 50 years old and in the morning we had a seminar from the director of iari on rice improvement in particularly and he has also dealt with the improvement of other cereals as well now plant breeding is squarely based on plant genetic resources and to speak on this subject there could be no better person than yourself sir dr kuldeep singh is a young and very dynamic personal personality in indian agricultural sciences he has a very brilliant academic career he was a agricultural graduate from sukhadia university udaipur then masters and phd from the reputed punjab agricultural university during his masters he won the gold medal sardar iqbal singh dilan gold medal for his the highest cgpa in the masters program then he started his service career initially he joined as an assistant wheat breeder probably in 1990 if i am not wrong then for about 10 years he was assistant wheat breeder and he was one of the uh, scientists who were associated in some of in developing some of the landmark varieties of wheat tbw series wheat varieties three mega varieties i should say then in between he visited international rice research institute 1992 to 1995 for three years probably under the legendary dr g uh, dr gs khus the well-known cytogenesis and breeder of rice who was also winner of the world food prize then he dr kuldeep singh did some of the very important and uh, say uh, works on enuploidy in enuploid analysis particularly in the development of trisomic secondary trisomic series in rice if our students are listening then they will know what is secondary primary tertiary trisomics then also in locating the genes and centromeres in the 12 linkage groups of rice then after coming from Erie, dr kuldeep singh equally worked on rice wheat as well as rice he took up both the crops important crops then he was appointed as the molecular geneticist to 1999 to 2007 probably that is the associate professor rank in pu that is the system as i know and he was promoted to professor Kedar, senior molecular geneticist 2007 to 2016 then in between he was the director of the school of agricultural biotechnology in pao Ludhiana. and during that time he developed the teaching and research program in agricultural biotechnology uh, both for undergraduate postgraduate and phd level programs then he was also equally active in Brittle development in rice and wheat, particularly in rice, he was instrumental in incorporating the genes for bacterial blight resistance, blast resistance, plant, brown plant hopper resistance, seed blight 
resistance, then novel genes for stripe rust, leaf rust, serial cis nematode, caramel bunt, and powder milieu in wheat. And he worked on the molecular bedding, markers state selection in rice, and also he was the leader of genome sequencing of wheat, one part of course, because wheat genome is very large, huge genome. And he was the leader in India to sequence the chromosome 2A uh, DNA sequence. Then he was also very instrumental in raising funds for his university through externally funded projects to the tune of more than 50 crores. He has published more than 100 very high, highly rated high impact factor journal papers, journals like Science, Science Communication, PNAS, Genetics, Theoretical and Applied Genetics, PLOS One, Crop Science, Xenome, Heredity, Euphytica, Plant Building, etc. He has been also involved in teaching and he has guided more than 15 masters and more than 15 PhD students and one of his students also received the prestigious Monsanto Bichel Ball of International Scholarship. Now from 2016, uh, August 2016, he has been sharing the all important National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. And, and we are very fortunate to have you, sir, today as speaker to speak on plant genetic resources. And you have chosen a very interesting topic by adding the, the genomes, genomic era. So I work wholeheartedly welcome you on behalf of the department, on behalf of the Assam Agricultural University. And also I welcome our eminent, some of the eminent audience today, participants, Dr. B. K. Sorma, who is also one of the speakers maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Then some of our statutory officers, Dr. P.K. Pathok, the Director of Excellence on Education, the Dean Faculty of Agriculture may also be there. Maybe also Vice Chancellor may join. So there are some distinguished scientists, teachers from all over India. I have seen some of the names are not familiar to me. I suppose they are uh, uh, scientists or teachers in elsewhere other than Assam Agricultural University. I welcome all of you, sir, and also I welcome all the student friends who are joining this, as well as in the live streaming, streaming in YouTube or Facebook Live. Thank you, sir. I welcome again, and then I uh, request. Dr. Kulip Singh to go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bora. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Am, am I audible now? Uh, good, good. Uh, Dr. Dr. Vidyu Sarma and Dr. Aran Sarma, all the faculty of Assam Agriculture University, Jorhat. Uh, my sincere thanks to Dr. Sarma, Aran Sarma and Dr. Bidyo for providing me this opportunity to be with uh, the students this afternoon. In fact, while one is at university, one enjoys teaching there, but when you are in the institute, these are the things which uh, are actually lacking. So whenever an opportunity comes for a lecture, I really grab it. And thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Bora told that uh, 
I've chosen a topic uh, uh, basically on plant genetic resources in India, the management and utilization in the genomics era. Uh, <clears throat> first part of the topic, I will let you know what's happening at MVP here. <coughs> and the second part to show you that uh, how the genomics as a tool could be used for pre-breeding, for bringing in new genes, mapping new genes and putting them into use in breeding programs. So uh, first half of course 70% will be the work that's being carried out at MDPGR and the sec next 30% may be work from Punjab Agriculture University uh, primarily on rice. Um, the students uh, this is actually a simple definition of the plant genetic resources, uh, what it is. Uh, is the genetic material of plant origin, which is of actual or potential value. And it could be in the form of seeds, the vegetative propagules, tissue, cell, pollen, or the DNA molecule. And the very important point is that this is heritable and it can be used in crop improvement programs. So that's the basic, very simple definition of uh, plant genetic resources. Uh, in fact, uh, the conservation of the plant genetic resources, a uh, conservation of the genetic diversity, is crucial for attaining the food security. And this is recognized in two very important documents, the global documents, what's called as uh, the second global plan of action for plant genetic resources of food and agriculture, and also in the Sustainable Developmental Goals, especially the SDG2, which is Zero Hunger, where the role of the plant genetic resources is pretty, very, very well defined. If you look at the uh, Sustainable Developmental Goals, which are also called as Millennium De Developmental Goals, of the 17 goals, which have almost 169 targets, six of these are directly related to the plant genetic resources. See, SDG 1 and SDG 2, that's poverty and zero hunger, these cannot be eliminated without good agriculture. And good agriculture cannot be there without good varieties. And good varieties will not come without good genetic resources. So that's how we have connected ourselves to sustainable developmental goals. Six of them, be it good health, be it the climate resilience, be it ensuring the production or on farm the biodiversity conservation, all these are related to the plant genetic resources. And when we use the word plant genetic resources management, it includes four basic activities. There's the collection of the genetic resources, their characterization, conservation, and finally the utilization. And this is a circle of form. It's I mean, this is a continuous process of this one. Something which is becoming useful, a variety which is really becomes a collection, part of the collection as well, becomes a part of the genetic resources as well that could be conserved and utilized again and again. So this, I will talk about one by one, very different ways. See, before I talk to the genetic resources, there are some very, very important facts which are actually the guiding force for us. If you look at this slide, we are right now 1.33 billion people. And by 2024, we expect it to be 1.44 billion when we will equalize China. By 2030, we will surpass China. And we are expected to really stabilize at 1.66 billion somewhere in 2050 or so. And in fact, this is the responsibility to feed this 1.66 billion. We need to increase our productivity by at least 70% if we take 2015 as a base year. And we are very much convinced that plant genetic resources will be key to achieve This is not the one time we have seen it. I will give you some of the examples as well, 
how energetic resources have brought the revolution. All of you know the Green Revolution, which was uh, because of uh, utilization of two important uh, two gene sources in wheat and rice. Those are the important examples, but not the only examples. And hence, to, to looking at the population growth, we are of the firm opinion that we can meet these challenges and germplasm will be key to it. And in fact, there has to be an enhanced exploitation of these genetic resources and there has to be a fundamental reinforcement of the entire breeding chain. This may not become clear to most of the students, but it is very important to say that if you really need to bring in some more genes, be it high productivity, be it for uh, biotic stress resistance, be it abiotic stress tolerance, be it nutrition, be it quality, you really have to bring them from genetic resources which are scattered and which per se may not be very high yielding. We have to look for those ones and you really have to, that's why we say, a complete reinforcement of the entire plant building chain is required if we really want to achieve those goals. That's one thing. The second paradox which today's agriculture is facing, if we see some, well, if not more than 100 years ago, more than 7,000 plants were being used at a local level for the food. And this diversity has gone down to a level that right now hardly three species, that is wheat, rice and maize, they actually provide 60% of our calorie values. And 90% of the calories come from just 30 species. This is, this is really very important and I give you one example here. This is, <clears throat> most of us have seen this one since 1960s. So if you look at the upper part of this picture, you will see that our percent consumption of some of these species have gone up. That will include wheat, maize and rice. But look at the bottom, that's more important. Our millets, sorghum, sweet potato, coconut, yam, they have all gone down. I mean, beg your attention students here, look at palm oil. Palm oil is not very, very good, it's not a very good oil. But 80% of the oil which we are importing in India is palm oil. And that's probably one of the worst quality oils available. Much worse than the coconut oil. And see our coconut consumption, it has gone down by 33% and the palm oil has gone up by 112% since 1960s. There are, these are very documented figures, very recent ones, how the things have changed over the last, uh, uh, let's say, 8 or 10 decades. And actually, all these things have led to a scale of challenge, actually. See the nutrition, one of the scale of challenges is nutritional imbalances. We have 2 billion people who lack micronutrients like iron and zinc. We have a very large population of 2 billion people who are actually obese. So it's not the deficiency, it's the obesity as well. So that shows the differential of the unequal distribution of the food grains in the population. These are all the things which have become probably because of a very small number of the species which we are consuming now. I, I bring your attention to this slide. We know from 60s when the Green Revolution took place, from net importers we became right now the net exporters. All those figures are available with you. But have a look on this slide. Look at the level of the micronutrient density. You compare all the states, but compare with India. See India. We have not changed much from 1961, or 80s, or even 2000 onwards. The color of the micronutrient density remains more or less the same in all the places. Many countries have improved. If you look at China, 
China, there was a decline in micronutrient density from in 60s, but they, from 60s they were okay, 80s they were not good, but see 2000 onwards they have improved. But we have remained more or less the same here. This is very recent example of uh, the data which has been generated uh, by our National Family uh, Health Services. This is the fourth data of the years from 2006 to 2016. Now have a look on this one. You see Punjab, I take your attention to Punjab and Haryana. Now these are the country's highest yielding states. Well, the unit productivity is pretty very, very high, maybe the highest in the world. The farmers are not poor as well. But see, the percentage of anemic, it has risen by 15% from 2006 to 2015. Why so? Why it happened? And if you look, if one analyzes it, the basic reason is that the number of species we are now growing at our farms. People are not growing many vegetables now. People are not growing many fruits now. Those minor vegetables, minor fruits, which are not of much commercial importance, they were actually the basic source of our nutrition. And that is why we say the genetic resources, the diversification is very, very important. Not only that, these are some of the global facts. In fact, those are the reminders for us. Since 1850, the date when, from when the, the, the actual uh, the records have been available on climate, last 22 years, out of last 20 years, 20 years have been the warmest in the history. See this one in red. The vertebrate population has fallen by an average of 60%. And this is just in the last 40 years. Human population has grown, but at the cost of something else. Look at the last one. More than 75% of Earth's land is substantially degraded. And that has put us into a difficult situation for years to come. When population is increasing, the climate is changing, other things, then the, 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 this earth, the, the soil degradation is there. All these are going to post us in difficult situations in years to come. See one more thing, this is again a global data. There is an unequal distribution of the food. If you look countries like uh, the North America, uh, anything which spikes out of this circle means they are overeating it. Have a look on India. Other than the cereals, our diets are deficit in everything. Be it vegetables, be it nuts, be it animal food, we are actually deficit in all of these things. We may claim that we are actually the net exporters at the time, at the moment. But that may be true only for cereals. For other crops, we are not that good at the moment. But these are some of the important facts which are available globally, and I want the students to share these one before actually I go to the other part. Now look at this one. Uh, this is this is how we're seeing. As of today, almost 47 percent of the calories you will have some data here and there five ten percent depending upon who is making the calculations almost 50 percent of the calories we are drawing from the cereals and in 2050 we don't expect much change we still may be really drawing 41 percent of our calories out of cereals there may be a little bit increase and decrease in others as well but what does that mean that yes, <clears throat> cereals will remain important, but we have to see how we can diversify our food to ensure that we are getting adequate and balanced nutrition. And in fact, based on these facts, which I presented in the last eight or ten slides, 
We at NBPGR are of a firm belief that sustainable agriculture and diverse food take, intake are equally important for the healthy population. So diversity has to be there. And here in this slide I have shown probably crops. I don't know how many students can recognize what these crops are. They are not wheat and rice. They are very different crops, very minor crops, but very important crops in our food chain. So having, having looked on a negative part of what we are expecting, we need to have a look on a positive side of it as well. And this slide gives you what Mother Nature has actually bestowed upon us as Indians. We are a gene-rich country. We are four of the 35 biodiversity hotspots they are actually present in India. We have a very large number of species which have evolved in India. And see, we have over 1,000 wild edible plant species. And almost 817 species of wild varieties of the crop plants which exist here in India. We are center of origin of not one, not two, but dozens of crops including rice, sugarcane, pea and pea, eggplant, banana, cucumber, many others. We are very rich in animal biodiversity as well. We are equally rich in fish biodiversity. We are equally rich in microbial diversity. Name anything. The country is actually rich. The mother India has been bestowed upon by the nature with a bounty. It's for us to see how we can conserve it, how we can preserve it. This is a slide which all of you know that out of the seven or eight centers of origin, we are among one of them. And look at a global scale now. Although there are several thousand species, India has a share of around 8 to 9 percent of the total plant biodiversity in the world. And after the green revolution, I don't before that, many of our peers could recognize, could realize that conservation of genetic resources are very, very important. And that's how people like Vavilo started the conservation strategies. And I'm happy to share with my students here that probably India was among a few countries in the world which gave emphasis to the plant genetic resources right from day one. And if you see right now, there are almost 6, 600 gene banks in the world. But there are only 20 gene banks which have a storage of more than 50,000 accessions in those. And those include 12 CG gene banks as well. So if we remove these 12 CG gene banks, there are not many countries who have the collection higher than 50,000. And I will give you details how much NDPGR is. So we are right now the world's second largest gene bank. The students to share with you at the moment. And we do feel proud as well. India has utilized the world's genetic resources for its agricultural development. And India has contributed to the global agriculture as well. This slide I will give you a few examples which are the textbook examples of how the genetic resources from India have actually helped the world. You see, for example, those who have heard about the grass stent virus disease in the Eastern Asia, it was said that there was a stage that this crop was almost getting out of cultivation because of the grass stent virus. Until Dr. Kush identified an accession of Horizon Nevada from India, and this accession gave a gene that really brought in resistance to grassy stent, and that gene's effect is still today. The down immune resistance of the melons in the United States, it has saved the melon industry. The U.S. sorghum industry was saved because of a resistance to green bag insects from here. Uh, you might have know the history of Canada. Most of the Europeans after Irish famine, they moved to Canada. And 
they took the seeds of the wheat from there to Canada. And in fact, initially, those like were highly susceptible to diseases, and the quality of those wheat wasn't really very good until someone took a line from India, was called as hard red Kolkata. This line actually changed the complete landscape of the Canadian wheat cultivation. And it was highly resistant to several diseases, to rust, and it really changed the landscape of wheat in Canada. This is the last one, the very recent example of the submergence 1A gene from a land race called as FR30. And the gene sub 1 has come from this line. Our breeders knew about this line from 1948. However, it was the international collaboration. I will give you one example at the end how genomics helped us to actually really identify this gene. But this gene is now one which has been used world over for developing varieties which are susceptible, uh, tolerant to submergence tolerance. It's a, it's, it's a really revolution in rice uh, use of this opportunity. So these are some of the examples we say the genetic resources exchange has to be more liberal, which we are trying to do it. We have to benefit from each other. So it's not the one way that India has benefited from the genetic resources from other countries. India has contributed to the global diversity as well. And these are a few examples, which are actually the textbook examples uh, for you to see how genetic resources from India have been used by other countries. To other students, to the students, I would like to share one more good thing that our peers, our political groups, political leaders, they are wise enough. And as a result, India did realize the importance of its genetic resources and India did realize the importance of the international collaboration as well. As a result, we became partners in CBD, are signatory to CBD, we are signatory to the Cartagena Protocol, we are signatory to ITPGFRA, we are signatory to Nagoya Protocol. These are the international instrumentations under which the genetic resources are being exchanged now. And in fact, to safeguard those genetic to the international instrumentations or international treaties, we have several legislations internal legislations like geographical indications of the goods, biological diversity act, PPVFRA, all these are actually the safeguards for our farmers and safeguards to the international treaty as well. And this slide I will come now from the general to the plant genetic resources, but before that let me share with my students here that Indian Council of Agriculture Research has one of the largest network of institutions under 13 right now and it has five bureaus, rather six, six ones are land bureau, we are not including that in genetic resources. But these five bureaus are very specialized bureaus and this is a unique in the world. No country in the world has such a network of the independent bureaus which are working with each other, which are working with their uh, institutions are the, 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 the species with which they are important. Be it animals, be it fish, be it microbes, be it insects, or be it plant genetic resources. And we at NBPGR are dealing with the plant genetic resources. And just to give glimpses, the NBPGR as an institute was established in 1976. So genetic resources were a part of our system as old as 1905 when IERI was established. There we had a very important unit in, in, in the botany department where plant genetic resources were really located. But more specialized came from 1976 onwards. And if you see, I've uh, seen at different phases, from an initial phase of establishing ourselves to the modern phase where we are now thinking of actually genomics uh, used for large scale characterization and utilization of the genes. We have grown over years as a 
as our needs are approaching, we are also growing like that. See, we have the systematic record of actually germplasm collection from 1946, even before the independence. And since then, NVPGI has actually undertaken more than 2,700 explorations. And out of these 27 explorations, we have collected more than, I mean, this figure has gone up now, it's more than 2.8 lakh samples which are indigenously collected. Uh, if we look at the genetic resources at the moment, we feel that uh, the attention has not gone much with the crop wild relatives. And we have now taken a very systematic approach of identifying the crop wild relatives. For example, we have 730 different species of crop wild relatives existing in India. And based on certain criteria, we have identified, I mean, this, this is from 168 crops. And based on that, we have identified the very specific species which will be really looking for conservation. And we have identified a set of 100 species initially to be really given a priority in the next five years to collect the germplasm. We have divided the nation accordingly based on the availability of these different germplasm from wild species in different regions of the country. And our emphasis is actually how to really ensure that we collect most, if not all, of the germplasm that's existing in the country. We have a responsibility of exchange, quarantine. You all are aware of the COVID. Probably one person traveled from one country which was infected to other countries, and more than 180 countries are now infected with the coronavirus. If the plant scientists were not very stringent right from the beginning, we might have introduced hundreds of new diseases. As we have some examples already available with us, where the diseases, the weeds have come along with the crops. But to tell you that NDPGL is on an average receiving more than 150,000 samples annually. And we check these samples one by one to ensure that no unwanted pest or pathogen enters the country. This is a just simple ones where we are what we are doing. Very important here, I would like to emphasize on this slide, because many of my colleagues, this high people germplasm and then probably commit for use of that germplasm with the students, especially for development for, for, for the thesis of the students. My young colleagues, my students, please be careful. We have more than 300 quarantine pests in the country. And if the person who is providing you the seed, if they do not issue you the phytosanitary certificate for that particular pest, we will not allow that seed to go directly to you without going that in a post-entry quarantine. We are supporting the country at the moment in a very big way. A large number of the gene banks have stopped actually giving the phytosanitary certificates. And we are developing the facilities to be sure that we serve the nation, we serve our researchers, the breeders, so that they do not feel any problem. Some of these have to be grown for one season, and we will be then issuing and uh, distributing the seed only next year. So sometimes you may feel impatient, you may feel that MDPGR is not giving the seeds, no, it's not because of anything else, but only to be sure that we are not introducing any unwarranted pathogen in the country. So please be patient if anything such happens. My younger faculty, be careful if you are committing something to the other thesis of the students. Don't do that one until you have a seed in your hands. 
can give you some one example. We have introduced recently about 2,000 accessions of the uh, this one, soybean. Um, and soybean has many diseases. We don't allow any in a single seed to go out without being grown in a post-entry quarantine facility. And out of 2,000, we could really identify and detect infection in almost 300 samples. We did not allow those to come out. If you were not stringent on that one, these diseases, the viruses, bacterial diseases, the fungal diseases, are even insects, they may become common in our country and they can cause huge losses to us. And this is what we are doing and using most of the modern things. Our next activity is of course conservation of the germplasm. We have different methods of conserving the germplasm, something what we call as medium term storage, where we store 4 to 8 degrees centigrade and this germplasm stays viable from 5 to 10 years, depending upon the species. The long term storage, which is conserved at minus 18 to minus 20 degrees Celsius, and the samples here are made viable from something 20 years to even some 40 years, we have the data as well. So we conserve the seed in the cryoconservation, in vitro conservation, and of course the field conservation as well. And this slide gives you now the how. Oh, yes, sorry, this is this is an old slide, probably I don't know why the slide has come here. Uh, we are right now 445,000 uh, accession as of uh, April 31. Uh, my 31, 2019, uh, 2020 is 4,45,000 genetic sources available with us. Oh yeah, this is a slide, so I, I forgot to. Up to 31st, 31st March. This is a germplasm which is being conserved in in vitro culture or in the cryoconservation. For some of my student colleagues and students, there are several species which do not produce the seed and you don't have an option but to really grow them vegetatively. And this has actually helped us. I will give you one example. There was a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, typhoon or something. Uh, in, in South India we have a Trichy as our station for, uh, for, for banana. And with these uh, 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 floods, the complete banana collection was actually uh, got wiped out. And those accessions were growing with us here in the in vitro, and we replenished the gene bank of the, our banana station at Rich. That's a very successful example. The students, there are some species whose seeds do not remain viable for a longer period. Because when we store the seed in minus 20, we bring its uh, water content to something as low as 5 to 6 percent. And if you remove, you bring the water content uh, down to 7 percent of some other species, they lose their viability. So those need to be conserved in the cryo. So we have all the three mechanisms, and of course, fourth is the one where you have the field gene bank. And see, NBPGR is not working in isolation. NBPG is working with a large number of centers which are scattered throughout the country and what we call the national active germplasm sites. So all those species which are propagated vegetatively, they are being grown at one or the other institution in different parts of the country. But numbering, system, all those things, they remain with NBPG. Just you go to gene bank, you can look on data anyway. For example, the collection, if somebody is interested in dryland crops, the germplasm, somebody is interested in vegetable crops, you have the germplasm. You have the germplasm, somebody is interested in looking in the land races. For example, here we have 15,000 land races of rice from across the, all the states. And with Assam, probably Assam has contributed to one of the largest numbers, 1,432. Land races have come from Assam, and Assam collection is very, very important collection of the land races here. Are the oil seeds, or somebody may be interested in knowing the millets. And to my students, that all this germplasm, when we are collecting it, we 
we ensure are those that's our utmost uh, sincerity to record some minimum passport data and if we have the passport data actually for crazy for example this is rice out of uh, almost 44000 accessions of rice which are collected from the country we have this passport data for almost 37000 of them and these are 37000 spots and if you go to this site actually you can select any crop there and if you select the crops like rice and if you click here on this spot it will give you the passport data of that accession that what that accession is what name of that one where from that has been collected and this these spots we have given at district level we are not gone below the district level for the public group because we have certain restrictions of a certain level we can give this uh, uh, data to, to the outsiders but not below the level of the district up to that now conservation alone will not have any use until unless we characterize the germplasm and actually give it to our users now here this is the phase when NDPGR has actually taken a strong lead in characterizing the germplasm and I will give you some examples a little later this is one field where we had taken all the weed germplasm and planted in one go and in fact these are 19,000 accessions of the weed which were grown at one place and evaluated for different traits and over the years, we have actually evaluated this germplasm in collaboration with all the expert institutions, be it the ICR institutions, our state agriculture universities, they are evaluating the, the germplasm against several diseases, insects, pests, and for nutritional traits as well. And we have well-defined germplasm for several traits. For example, if somebody is interested in leaf blast, we have something for the board accessions, which we are very well characterized. If somebody is interested in rice tungo, something for the four them. So likewise, for all these crops, this type of data is available when we be here. You can have the data accession-wise. For example, rice, if you see rice tungo, these are the accessions. If someone is interested in getting the germplasm which is resistant to rice tungru, you can strictly give a request to NDPGR, not asking give us the rice tungru resistant lines, just quote these IC numbers and you will get the exact numbers of those lines for you. Likewise, we have this data for almost all the crops. We have the data not available from the wild species as well. And the soil data you can see at the PGR portal. <coughs> I will advise the students to go to the PGR site, visit the PGR portal, and see how this whole information is available to you for use and viewing. We are very actively exchanging the germ classroom. And this is a germplasm which has gone as per the intent from the different uh, intenders within the country. This is within the country. Uh, on an average, 10 to 20,000 accessions are actually shared with our colleagues. Because many times people raise this question that how much the MDPD's uh, gene banks are being used. This is an exact data with you. And this does not include the germplasm which we are sharing with our colleagues under different developmental projects. I will tell you a little bit later how, how we are now, uh, what way we are operating now. But this is a normal routine germplasm which anybody is asking and we are providing them. So, just for the students, uh, a little bit of the pictures which you may be interested in seeing some of them, see the variability which is available. Uh, see variability, this is a sorghum, see the color, this is variability in rice, oh, variability in tripura, you have the black rice, see the, this is this is the uh, the kernel, see the black color kernels to the olive green kernels to the white color, white kernels, all sort of variability which is available. 
see the variability again from second state only for the beans see variety variability this is a wild species of cucumbers which has actually given the boundary mildew and the downy mildew resistance genes to the cucumber variation in hands variation in wild species this, these are some of the wild species of potatoes brinjo which are available in the country Variability in some of the minor fruits within the country which have been very very important for us as a nutritional security other fruits variability in just one crop barley variability in fact if we say MBPGR is not working specifically we are working with genetic resources of most of the crops but we have a mandate of working on some of the important crops which are actually potential crops or you call them neglected crops or you call them underutilized crops we are working on these crops as well for example Tumba, Rice Bean, Amaranthus, Concorda these some of the students might may not be even able to really identify these species this is for example buckwheat a very important gluten free wheat a very important crop in Japan then Koda, this is uh, a sweet Karela which uh, is being used by uh, uh, the people who are uh, 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 sugar patients. The Kalingna, this is the species which grows the most driest conditions, driest deserts of the country. It grows there. So the buckwheat, all these crops we are working on those. Now, this is uh, what the genetic resources, the conservation is so far. However, if we look globally, there is data which is a bit disturbing. Some, most of the gene banks say that only less than 5% of the genetic resources are being used in breeding programs. That's true. However, in fact, uh, that, that this is currently a major gap between the operations of the plant genetic resources collections and the modern plant data. Most of the breeders are not using the genetic resources from the gene banks. But fortunately with the recent technologies, be it the genomic resources, be it the double haploid population, be it the speed breeding, the utilization of genetic resources has started actually increasing in India and globally as well. Some data, for example, this is Iris Gene Bank, which is one of the most of the best characterized gene bank because a single crop gene bank. Even there, if you see less than five percent of the genetic resources have been used for crossing programs. So, dear students, here it is unlocking the genetic potential that's stored in gene banks. That's our responsibility to the future generations. Our responsibility to feed 1.66 billion in 2050. And we will not be there, but you all will be there since you are all the agriculture graduates doing masters in plant breeding genetics. You will have a responsibility to feed 1.66 billion people in 2050. So you have to see how better you can use the genetic resources for improving productivity. The slide, all you know, this is, I put that uh, yes, because of the developments in genomics, the use of genetic resources, precise use of the genetic resources, are actually increased. I just give one example. There's a literature published in 2010, where with a simple sequencing of around one x sequencing of 570 land races, they were able to map. 3.6 million SNPs and using these ones, analyzing this data, they could map most of those genes which were already mapped because when you are doing this type of study you really have to take into consideration, you really have to prove the concept and they try to see that all those genes which were mapped using the five parental populations, those were, they were able to map all of those using association analysis. So association genetics, association analysis, the GWAS has become 
a very important tool for gene bank curators to see how better their genetic resources could be used. Uh, many people raise a question that how the sequencing has helped us. And I take this one example. This gene, I mean this, this, this line F13, which was which is resistant or tolerant to some versions, we this was known to us since 1948. And it could not be used by the breeders. I'm sure hundreds of crosses might have been made, but new variety was developed which was better than this one. And I think that became clear only later on. And the G was this tolerance is located on the short arm of chromosome 9. You see this is a centromeric position here on chromosome 9. And getting the combination in this one. So it was possible to map this gene on the short arm, but without the rice genome sequencing, it would not have been possible to clone this. And once the gene was cloned, we knew the reasons that how the negative linkages were there with this gene, that they were not allowing the non-conventional plant breeders to really exploit this one. But once that negative linkage was broken, you have a genetic stock which doesn't have that negative gene, but this positive gene which confers resistance to some versions. You have the varieties, not one, you have dozens of varieties now available uh, uh, from them. Now this took C almost from 1950 to 2010 when this gene was cloned, are put into the varieties. So almost 60 years to use a gene. And this became possible with the genomics. And that's what I'm saying, how to use genetic resources in genomic cell. Because when we are saying the utilization, it's not the wild species all, it's not the is the land races, is the traditional varieties, old varieties, whatever name you want to do to them, those may be very poor yielding, they may be tall, they may have many negative effects, uh, many negative traits, but they may be having some very positive, very good genes in them, be it the sub one for this one, or the Kassala for the uh, tall gene, and many more are coming up. And this is where, if we use the modern technology with the classical breeding, with this was one example which has actually paid us. In fact, we are moving towards an area what is now termed as genoplasmic and in fact using the we even had a concept of the code collection which was given by Franklin in 1985. But the codes which are generated based on the morphological traits, they have certain limitations. So if we now combine the data which is the geographical data, morphological, or pedigree, and then combine it with high throughput genomics, I can assure you that we will have the real, very robust cores available with us, and those will be the ones which breeders will like to use, because breeders may not like to use larger number of accessions with them. And this is especially true with the wild species. And I'll give you some of the examples how to do. See, this is one example how, how this useful this is? This is a simple uh, analysis of the very small set of germplasm of Northeast. And using the normal markers, reservoirs, 50k SNP chip, very specific groups are coming down. And then we did one more experiment having around 300 accessions coming from different states, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 states. And we did the structure analysis of this one. And see the plant breeding students. Now this is the germ plasma which has come from Andaman Nicobar. This does not share anything with the germ plasma which has come from the Eastern UP. Eastern UP germ plasma, most of it is really unique, but having some overlap with Uttarakhand germ plasma. Most of the Uttarakhand germ plasma is unique, having a little bit of overlap, and say this germ plasma from Jharkhand populations. This smaller experiment gave us an idea of probably the genetic land races which we have collected from different parts of the countries they may be unique. And we have now, I'll give you a little bit later, very mega projectile of around 50 crores 
funded by the DBT, where we'll be really analyzing more than 12,000 land races available in the country for phenotype, for genotype, and generating the groups. This is how the genomics has given us some idea, and we are seeing the breeders have to really make now advantage of this one, make, make, make really see how, how we use the population from the genetic resources from them, cross them with the UP, uh, Eastern UP genetic resources, and see how, how variability we can really improve this one. And it was based on this one, and the PGI has developed a model now. And this model I have given for the minor pulses because this was the first project we really embarked on. We are not going for the piecemeal analysis. This is not 12,000, this is 16,000 now. We have taken the complete germplasm of all our minor pulses. These are six minor pulses, Vigna and one Haskra. We have grown this complete germplasm. See, for example, this is Vigna. 4,100 accessions of these genetic resources planted at two places at Jodhpur and in Badnapur in, 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 uh, in Maharashtra. So we are actually characterizing the germplasm, all phenotyping. This is breeders who are doing it. And we'll be genotyping all these 4,100 genetic stocks in one go. So that Using a combination of the phenotype and the genotype, we should be able to identify which are the ones which are duplicates because initially earlier using SSR markers which had their own limitation, you cannot choose large number of SSR markers on a large number of visual present lines, but you can use resequencing, you can use GBS, you can use SNP chips for analyzing a very large number of genetic resources with a large number of this uh, the high throughput genetics. Just this is one year work. See the variability in the color of the mung bean color. See variability in the grain size. Very small grains to very bold grains here. See, see this here. See the color from yellow to black. This is old bean. 2200 accessions grown at Ludhiana at and Hyderabad. This is Ludhiana, this is Hyderabad all in the fluid conditions, so we'll be genotyping all of them, we are phenotyping all of them. Have a look, it's very small, the variability. See the number of pods per plant, the minimum number of pods per plant was 11, to as high as 1, sorry, 185. Number of primary branches. These are the traits we really need to look now. We are actually characterizing all our germplasm. And based on GWAS analysis, the minimum thing which we do to breeders is uh, yes, these are the genetic resources with this trait, and these are the blocks of the genome where these traits are actually located. The geneticists, the breeders, the molecular biologists in state agriculture universities, SAUs, our, our ICR institutions, which are crop based institutions, really develop, can develop the bipedal populations to actually map those genes. Okay, that was, that, that was strategically this one. See how, how these things have changed. I take this one example, which is a global example. This is basically one of the wild species of wheat which is the D genome donor you might have read. We had the germplasm with the cancer stage, you know, still the cement and this is, sorry. This is PAU. This was analyzed with a large number of the markers and see how much is the overlap. So we are actually working with something which is an overlap. See here, you as a cancer, they have 30% duplicates. Similar gene bank has almost 50% duplicates and PAU germplasm is almost 55% duplicates. So this was not possible using the only the morphological traits. Using the high throughput genome is possible to do this one. And map the genes. And of course I will tell you, use a wild species is pretty difficult. And hence having a unique set of core are the mini core is something that is very, very important. This example I have given again from Tarshan. 
Vikram Girls Group and Cancer State University using high throughput genomics and almost 500 accessions of Tashai, they identified the 40 accessions which form the core, which are very unique. And look at the physical location of these ones as well. So they are really diverse from each other. So this is how we really need to use high throughput genomics, identify very unique sequence species, because crossing from the wild species, large number of them is not feasible. It may be okay with when it comes to the cultivated genome plasm. But these are some of the examples which really give us a light how, how you can open up your gene banks. I will take you now to Punjab Agriculture University, where we started this work somewhere in 2000 onwards. So in fact, we knew the bottlenecks. You can really bring the variability either from the land species or you can take the variability from the wild species. And we, this work, is it okay? SMA is okay? Okay, and I'll just take example of rice, how we did, systematically. I request all the participants to mute their microphones. So this is, this is the work, I'm explaining from what we did at Punjab Agriculture University, systematic and continuity, the two things which are very, very important for us. Giving you one basic example, we had almost 1700 wild species accession with us. And in fact, when we started initially, we had a very small number, 300 of them. We screened them with the bacterial blight because uh, bacterial blight is a major disease of rice in Punjab. And we had seven pathotypes at that time. And we screened these 300 accessions with all the seven pathotypes and identified some of the accessions which were resistant to all the seven pathotypes. So we started working on a set of those. Something from Nivara, Gilabama, Barfly, Rufi Pogan, four different species we started working on to this one. And I will give you one example how these things have changed. Nivara started crossing that line, developing the populations, using the classical SSR map, mapping our genes somewhere in this region, but it was too big. But since by that time, rice genome sequence was available, we identified the new markers from the genome sequences and mapped this whole region. This was actually 30 that time, somewhere here, but still it was a bigger region. And then what we did actually went to the individual backs because we saw that the gene we have here, this one, this was mapping between in a region which we are there, which we are based on this, we can delineate the backs. And we, once we delineated those backs, this region, we did the analysis of what are the genes, and there were some of the genes which were actually disease resistance genes. So we thought probably some of those genes will be the one which is XL30 or XL38, which was later designated. So we sequenced some of them. One gene which we initially thought could be a candidate gene for this uh, gene actually had a very large deletion here. And when we looked on the function analysis of this gene, this was non-functional. So it was clear that this is not a candidate gene for XL38, but it gave us a beautiful marker, STS marker. See, you have the parent one, which is cultivated. You have the parent two, which is a wild species. This is the susceptible genotype, resistant ones, and the heterozygous. So this marker then actually, starting from classical map, using the innovative approach, we were able to identify a marker, which was a gene based very closely linked to a, this, uh, this gene, which, is, which was later on designated XA38, and using this marker for marker assisted selection. That was one example and we used that one. However, the things started changing. For example, until 2007, brown plant hopper was not a problem in Punjab. 2007, we saw the first epidemic-like situation of brown plant hopper. And looking at the known genes of BPH, none of them was very, really, very effective. We went to the wild species and screening was not that easy here. My 
six entomology colleagues that screened the germplasm. We identified some of the resistant lines, repeated those, and then identified some of them which were really showing resistance and they were diverse as well. And I'll give you one example up here, this one. In fact, it took us 10 years almost to come to identify a very closely linked marker to XL38 gene. But when we were working with the DPH, by that time that Rentesing had already published this paper on the high density SNP. So we used this information before they've actually published it. We knew that they're doing it. They were able to provide, they were th thankfully they provided us all the data before publications and using that one we could map this gene and this gene has been designated as BPA34. And this is one PhD student who did it. Starting from generating the populations to mapping and this is a fine mapping actually and we knew the SNP markers, we knew the STS markers which are now linked to this gene. We have successful example of another gene that's called as XF45, this has been published recently, it has come from Glaberman. This is the only gene which is effective against all the 10 virulences actually in Punjab. We have now 10 pathotypes of bacterial blight. See how we work here. We work both basic as well as applied. Once we had the good genotypes coming available, we shared it with our plant breeder colleagues. They released this as a variety of PR127. This is in cultivation. We were Actually, four PhD students actually worked on this problem to identify where this gene was located. It's a long history, I'm not going into that detail, but we never expecting that this gene is located here. And this became possible only because of use of the GPS. So using the next generation sequencing techniques, identifying large number of the markers, we have identified a SNP marker and of course the STS markers which are being used now for its analysis. This gene is very closely linked to XL13, but XL13 is not a uh, factor in Punjab and we now know based on this whole analysis that this is away from XL13, this ordinates are different from XL13, that's why a new gene designation got XL45. We have another successful example where we shared this material, integration lines with our National Rice, uh, Indian Institute of Rice, sorry, NRR, Hyderabad. They worked on this one and they identified an integration line coming from Bloomy Petula. And this integration line was resistant to both seeding stage blast as well as net blast. And they used it for mapping purposes and they identified the markers. Now this gene is published as a new gene PI68 gene. Very close markers identified and I think they are very close to uh, cloning this gene as well. We have an example of a very good trait which increases the grain number from the wild species. A marked gene and already we have transferred. Now see, we are not keeping these genes. They are published and we are sharing our material with our colleagues. So with XL38, you see three publications have come where they have combined XL38 with different other genes and varieties have been developed. And some of them are actually gone for the notification now. So this is one of the success stories of identifying genes from the wild, transferring them, are simultaneously understanding the inheritance of these genes, identifying the markers which are closely linked to those one and give it as a package to the breeders for breeding purposes so that we reach this stage. And as I told you that we started 2001 as the initial year for, from working with the wild species and by 2020 we have several varieties where these genes are. This 20 years, I don't see a parallel example where so many genes coming from wild have come to the commercial level in such a short period. Nowhere, nowhere in the world I have seen any such example where it's a business itself has come. Uh, I will skip this one and of course if any student is interested in reading those uh, work on introgression, it's already published in Crop Science in 2017, you can look for that one. Another example, I will take only one example from wheat. How genomics can really help you in identifying the sources. See, this is again a wild species. 
This five species Viaticum, which is an A genome species of wheat, a diploid species, it has a high level of color resistance to powdery mildew. And when we did the analysis, we found that two QTAs, two genes actually mapping on the same arm of the chromosome. That was one part, mapping those genes with, of course, using high throughput genetics, using the wheat genome sequencing information, we could really map to the very small regions. And then we use the markers linked to these genes and transfer these two genes individually into the, in the background of cultivated weeds. See, if you use the classical approach, you may get a powder mildew resistance in the integration lines, in the macros lines. But one will not be sure whether that resistance has come from this gene, or from this gene, or from both the genes, or how much is the non-recurring genotype coming from the donor species. So using these markers which are very closely linked to this one, we did the marker assisted selection and in fact this again is the first example of transferring powdery mildew resistance from wild species to the cultivated species individually and then we had these integration lines where we know some of the integration lines had only one gene, this gene, some others had only this gene and where there was the smallest of the interrogation, we crossed those two lines so that we have combined these two genes with the minimum of the linkage drag coming from this one. This was possible only using the high throughput genomics. So, Chris, a key message is that the numerous genetic and genomic resources are available, which you can use either in house, and of course, now we have the feasibility of outsourcing them. But the key to the success is how better you know your germplasm. And of course, availability of the low cost screening techniques. If we have these two things, the genomics is available to you, you can really use them in a high throughput way and identify and transfer any sort of variability you want from any species to any other species. And with this one, I thank you all. Uh, this, this slide, uh, again, I have to maybe, so you, you all know the Pangong So. This is actually the Pangong So where we went. This was in 2015. And we have collected one species from here. It's a wild species of wheat, a distant relative of wheat. Now this is among the cultivated species, around the useful species, that was the one which was growing at the highest level, highest altitude, where oxygen levels are low. So I'm sure this must be having a very different mechanism of respiration and photosynthesis as well. This part of the lake, which is in India, is actually salty. Have a look here, this is salt. So this species grows very well in the salt. The hills of uh, lake never receive any rainfall. And this species grows comfortably in these dry land areas. So that means it must be having a salt tolerance. It must be having drought tolerance in it. It must be having very different mechanisms for photosynthesis or respiration. But if someone wants to look at those things, but how we have to put whole life into this one. That's our key message. If you really want to work, you have to work very largely, very committed and sustainable. And of course, I invite you all that collectively we need to unlock these gene banks to ensure the food and the nutrient security and environmental stability of the country. And with this, I think all my colleagues from NDPGR, whose data I have used here for sharing with you, and all my students and colleagues at PAU Rubinana who have contributed to this work. Thank you, thank you very much. It's up to you, as you say, I don't have any problem. Yeah. <laughs>
yes uh, any variety any hybrid that will go for notification has to be registered with MDPGR whether it's a public sector institution or a private sector institution if you have to notify your hybrids through PSC that is deposited with MDPGR along with the parents and when you have this material with MDPGR that is available to everyone under our material transfer agreement. That's a standard. That's a, we have a very specialized uh, uh, this material transfer agreement for the public sector institutions. We have the one for the private sector institutions as well. But those institutions which are actually 100% Indian, no, no external equity in them, for us they are as good as the public sector institutions, so it's available to them as well. Yes. Is that, was that the question that Samra or Sarma? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. See, if, if you have a gene that is actually mapped, and closely mapped with the flanking markers, then there are very well devised DACA strategies where you can really have a good combination of the economics and because you cannot use the larger populations, you are not very rich all the time. But in that case, there are very well defined procedures. You can, in first DACA, you can select a marker on one side of the flanking region which is very close to the gene of interest and in the next backcross you can select another marker which is flanking to that one. In two backcrosses you can actually identify the plants with the minimum of the linkage. Now this is when you are using it with the cultivated species. If you are using them with the wild species then in the backers 1 or backers 2 population, along with the trait of your interest, of course, uh, I, will, I will never suggest going for marker analysis in the backers 1 because there are a large number of the uh, wild traits which appear in the backers 1 generation when you are working with them. Uh, a bigger, if it generates a larger population, you will be able to identify a plant which has the relatively less amount of the linkage or undesirable traits coming from the wild. But when you go for a second back cross, I think he has lost the connection. Anyhow, it was a very interesting and yeah. Are you hearing me now? It's very comprehensively he has covered the topic. Very interesting. I am sure lot many participants are uh, inquisitive about uh, the different aspects of the topic. Uh, let us see whether he can come back with the connection on the time online. Hello. 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 Dr. B.K. Sama, please. Oh, okay. Uh, are, are you hearing? Yes. Uh, how, uh, what is, what is called if I didn't see me? I, I, I didn't see me. Yeah. Is there? Disconnected. Oh, okay. Oh, he's not here. Okay, I have yes. some, <laughs> some query yeah. uh, to him. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Actually, uh, some time back, we discussed with him about a big program using the minor food crops of the northeastern region. 
uh, I do not know the status now, uh, whether he has any plan. That is what I would like to ask him because that will be very much useful because, you know, we do not have, uh, say, any uh, uh, fingerprinting, you know, program on minor food crops because, you know, we have to claim that they are of this region. Yeah. So uh, we should have a big program and then NBPGR with support from NBPJ, it will be easier for us to go ahead. Yes. So this is what uh, I would like to ask him again. And this and is also related to nutritional security. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because there are a lot of minor food crops, you know, which yes. are so important. And then, you know, people have been using them now. Some of them are being used commercially also. But, you know, we do not have any uh, rights on them. So, you know, we should have a good program. Yeah, uh, our region is so rich. Yes, it's sort of you know diverse fruit crops. A leteku seteku moi bako kotha kuch nahi. Bako kono shadi nahi. Leteku ko paniyal ko. These are getting endangered also. So yes. you know we should have a big program. First thing for conservation of those plants as well as for you know having our rights on those plants. Uh, I have seen Dr. Kishore Sharma is online. Yeah, Kishore. Kishore, I am mourning you because of your other engagement, you could not attend the morning session. Uh, we are thankful to you also for sponsoring this program under your NAHEP project. Hello? Kishore, are you hearing? Yeah, morning session I too couldn't attend because you know I had another meeting in DBT. Yeah, yeah, a review meeting, you know, so yeah, that's, that's right. why you know, I had to be there. I told Roman, and I'm happy that you know, uh, and I, I also thank you for arranging this particular presentation <laughs> of Dr. Kulik Singh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, back. Yes, back. Uh, I, I, I had few queries, of course, the students mm -hmm. will ask you about the yeah. list of questions, but I had few queries. First thing, you know, uh, sometime back, if you remember, you know, we talked about, we discussed about a project, big project, using the minor food crops of this region for conservation as well as, you know, uh, for fingerprinting or genotyping those, you know, plants so that, you know, you can claim them because they are our plants. Okay. So, you know, do you uh, seriously think about that program, you know? <laughs> I think uh, in my first day, COVID has actually made a lot of negative impact. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, principal secretary appears to the uh, prime minister, uh, Dr. Raghavan, uh -huh. they have nine mission projects. Okay. And one of them is a biodiversity. Yeah. And this biodiversity project, there are already large number of the meetings have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, uh, we were almost at the final stage to, to really draft a program where minor foods will be the most important component of that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's going on. I think that got stuck because of uh, this coronavirus is in between and uh, uh, let's see how things happen. Otherwise, that's a, that's a proposal already. Oh, okay. Uh, another query that is, uh, sorry, can I, Roman? Can I go, uh, Bola Bola, sir? Can I go ahead and a few more queries? Go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Kuldeep, uh, are you actually comparing your genomic uh, you know, resources which uh, say equisat genome resource for pulses and similarly with the ED resources for rice because you know a lot of uh, there have been a lot of duplications but duplication is also important of course we can keep it in many but you know how advanced you are or how rich you are then compared to those uh, or they are richer than our NPPG bank uh, see as uh, as a um, Comparing NBPGR with bees is not be possible because we are working with 2,000 species. It is working with just one. And it has 100,000 extensions of rice, so has NBPGR. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ecosystem is working with the seven crops. Uh, yes. So actually, those gene banks cannot be compared with the NDPG. Right, right. You are dealing with not many crops. Yes, that's now, true. Now, coming to this one, the recent projects we have, we have, we could get the funding of around 3,000, 1,500 crores, 250, 300 crores from DBG and remission project, wherein we have actually started characterizing our genetic resources and food. I gave them one slide of uh, the, the, the minor pulses. We started from the minor crops because you have a good application coming from the major crops all over the world. You have large number of minor crops we don't have it. Five, six, six minor pulses where we'll be actually characterizing our germplasm 100%. So there are 16,000 accessions. And all of Hickory said has uh, 70,000 accessions of some crops or so. Right, uh, land access of rice, uh, our record shows that we have 25,000 or something, we did some under internal analysis, duplicates, grow out tests, we could bring them to 12,000. All these 12,000 land races plus 3,000 accessions that will comprise all the released varieties of rice, uh, a few hundred international global lines, so making something 15,000, and we will be updating the resequencing data, our 90k chip data for all these 15,000. If you can compete, you can have a com compare in that stage. Mm -hmm. no, question, no question of comparing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, with it being said, we have started this project on uh, chip field where we call as a pan-gene bank, uh, there's a pan-genome, you, you see the, uh, the core definition earlier given by Frankel, so we, we are trying to modify this in terms of the pan-gene banks as well. So ChipP we are taking as one of the examples where we will be combining the resources and both genetic, genomic and the financial resources in India and ICRI set to actually analyze the complete uh, set of uh, ChipP germplasm both the gene banks so that we are sure how much duplicacy we have across the gene banks and how much of that will be a unique to be used by the billions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We are going different way for minor oil seeds. We are taking four oil seeds, CSM, Niger, safflower, linseed. See for example CSM. CSM is a crop, very high value crop actually for export purposes. Two major diseases in that, phylody and dry root shot. Not even a single source known to us so far. To answer that question, we have, we have taken all our 7,000 germplasm, we have 9,000 germplasm of this one. We have taken out all the 9,000 germplasm and planted at two places. Go for one level as the general, I mean, as the natural conditions. To see if you have some which may be escapes or may be real resistant. And then we have already completed one year of that one. We have already a set of the lines which has shown some positive uh, resistance. We'll be screening those under artificial conditions and stringent conditions to see if we have any source of resistance to phylogeny or not. So once we do all these for this type of trades, until unless we do 100% germplasm, we cannot say that there's no resistance. So after screening these 9,000, if we don't get a good source of resistance to phylogeny, we can say yes, there's no source in the genetic germplasm. You may look for the alternative way, the transgenics, gene editing, whatever they do. But if we can find them, this is how MDP here is actually taking. So we have these 16 crops right now on which we are already funding and we have started working on this. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a national uh, global network and uh, uh, Assam Agriculture Industry is a part of that one. And mm -hmm. same thing I am advocating for banana and uh, uh, this one citrus. Yeah, so we, we try to ask them to go different way, not in the piecemeal. Let's go in a, in a, in a, in a holistic manner to collect the germ plasma in a holistic manner, characterize in a holistic manner, identify the genes, see what you have, look for it, not into, okay, you have 10 accessions, you have 20 accessions, and like that.
Snip chip or resequencing or GPS. And uh, of course, we really have to develop some statistical uh, procedures as well, or statistical limits. See, for example, if you do the snip analysis, you already have some error in that one. And we know that how much is the error rate in that. So if you keep that one, and if you have, you say, okay, we keep. 1% similarity or 1% difference as being similar or 1% as an error then if you have two lines which are 99% same with respect to not one, not two, let's say 50,000 snake markers or 90,000 snake markers, 100,000 snake markers then we can easily say them, yes they are duplicates but then we are very cautious that the gene bank curators will never agree for that one they will say no, right? We respect them. We say yes, this is collected, this is their energy. So you have now two things to reduce, two, two basically objectives for reducing the duplicacy. One, you have to identify the minimum number of the germplasm which has the highest level of variability which the breeders will use. And second, you may have to keep them as genetic resources. Even if you have the same as, as a molecular biologist, I may say they are same. As a gene bank curator, they say no, 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 they are different. Let's conserve them. It could be a duplicate for me, it could be a different accession for them. If someone is interested in really looking more details into this one, they can choose those uh, uh, material for other analysis. There are two ways. One is that somebody can develop a genetic stock and register that with MDPGR. And they register anyone. See, any material that comes to MDPGR, that is in the public domain. Right? Whether there's a farmer's variety, there's a breeder's variety, there's a wild species, is a registered germplasm that's in the public domain, you can use that under this material transfer agreement. Right? That's a simple thing. Now coming BARC, BARC has already identified some of the genetic stocks in Mongbi with the claim are the deletions, large scale deletions and imparting resistance. They are registered with us. Those could be shared, anybody wants to have them. We have a complete list of 1300 registered genetic stocks. Anyone wants to use, anyone of them can use it. Second, Bark has released several varieties through ICR system. Groundnut, for example. 
Now those varieties will go for notification only if the material of the seed comes to LVPG. So once the seed is LVPG, it's available to you anyway. I can answer it a slightly different way that we have all sort of germplasm which anybody can test it under organic conditions and find if any of those lines are better for them. We do not have the mandate to check them for organic cultivation. It's the crop based institutions who will do it and if they want germplasm, they can take it. And MDPGR is providing actually germplasm to many people. They are specifically requesting that they will evaluate it for organic uh, cultivation. And in fact, our traditional germplasm will be more suitable for organic cultivation rather than our present day varieties. Uh, this is just a, 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 not a rule, but a general rule. Uh, assumption. Comments to be remember. I think uh, you can wonder, Raman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for covering the topic so nicely, very comprehensively, and also interacting to the participants and giving so much of time and efforts. You have made two, three times a trip to Assam University University and um, uh, maybe in your official program or otherwise. And because of this COVID situation, you have been, you are easily accessible to us online in this webinar. Probably it would not have been possible otherwise because of your very, very busy schedule. We thank you very, very much on behalf of the department organizing committee as well as on behalf of the university. We thank you profusely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.